welcome to Faith Unaltered. This is our finale of the launch event day. Uh, I'm David Russell here with my co-host Tyler Fowler. What's going on, man? What is up, brother? I'm excited for this debate. Is Christianity true? Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, Michael Granado. I am excited to be here with you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for dedicating your time to do this tonight. Am I allowed to unmute now? Oh, oh, absolutely. We'll absolutely. allow it. This Come time. on. In. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, guys. Yeah, Thanks man. We appreciate you uh, reaching out and coming on, man. And again, uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan McLatchy, thank you again for coming on. Yes. You hung with us last night to the bitter end. That was fun. <laughs> that was fun. That was really fun. But uh, yeah. So, uh, Tyler, what's going on with this debate? What are we doing? We're discussing whether Christianity is true or not. And so we have an informal setting to where Dr. McClatchy and Michael can, you know, in, engage back and forth. We're going to jump in with some questions. Uh, obviously, we have to, man, you know what I mean? But uh, again, I'm excited to get this debate started. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, but you won't be giving opening statements. Is that, is that correct? I think, More I think we said we were giving 15 minute opening statements. Oh, so okay. Yeah. Okay, fair yeah. enough. So we will begin with 15 minute opening statements then. And then, David, what would be next on the agenda? Are we going then right into cross to, exam? It's really not a cross examination, okay. it is a dialogue. And that's what we specialize in here with the informal dialogue. So uh, that's gotcha. in most of our debates. We've had a couple, we had some informal, but a lot of people like to go and, and just dialogue it out. I mean, it's it's really good way to, to I, I guess, do it. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So with that, we got Is Christianity True? Uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, you are the affirmative. So I will let you start whenever you would like, and I will get your time going as soon as you make your first word. Let me just share my screen quickly first. Maybe Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Get a, we'll, we'll make sure it gets on there. All right. Um, share screen. Um, Okay, can you see my PowerPoint slides? I sure yes. can. Yes. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. Well, I will get started then. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, and particularly Michael, for agreeing to participate in this uh, discussion. I'm looking forward to it very much. So without further ado, let's launch into the topic, is Christianity true? So let me just give an overview of my argument that I would adduce in support of Christianity. And then I'm just going to focus on a subset of that in this particular opening statement. So I would make, um, so basically I have six different lines of argument for Christianity. One would be the argument for the resurrection, the trilemma argument, which was most famously developed by C.S. Lewis in his uh, book, Mere Christianity, the argument for messianic prophecy, uh, um, I should say the conversion of Paul, um, contemporary miracles, and the survival of the nation of Israel against all odds. So let's begin with the argument for the resurrection. This is the only argument I'm going to cover in the opening statement. So here is a summary of my argument that I'm going to be developing. This is um, a, what I call a Paley style approach. It's inspired by the famous Christian philosopher William Paley, um, who I'm sure that my opponent is very familiar with being an historian of science. Um, so basically the argument runs as follows. We possess testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive and I would argue the evidence for that is quite spectacular. Secondly, the content of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceived. Third, the circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceivers. And finally, therefore, the most probable explanation is that the content of their testimony is true. So let's begin with this first contention that we possess testimony from apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive. So one line of evidence for this is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, where Paul's writing um, to the Corinthians and he says, For I delivered to you as a first importance why I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to keep us, and that would be Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, last of all as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, I want to focus on what Paul says next after he's just given that uh, creedal outline of the core tenets of the gospel. He says in verse 9 to 11, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But with the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I would harden any of them. There was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. 
where that was I were they, so we preach and so you believe. And so he thus assumes that the Corinthian Christians understand his message concerning the death, burial, resurrection of Christ to be in alignment with what's already been proclaimed by the other apostles, in particular, Peter and, and the others. Um, and we know independently that the Corinthians were acquainted with the preaching of Peter, at least, because in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul chides the Corinthians for having divisions and factions in their midst. Some say, I follow Kephas, others I follow Apollos, others I follow Paul, others I follow Christ, and so on. So uh, that provides evidence that the resurrection claim actually reflects the perspective of the apostles themselves. Um, we also can turn to the reliability of the Gospels and Acts for evidence that um, concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection claims that were made concerning the resurrection. So there's a number of categories of evidence that one could deduce <clears throat> in support of that. One would be undesigned coincidences, which we'll discuss, expressive silence, artless similarities, unexplained illusions, actual biblical confirmations, um, difficult local knowledge, the criterion of embarrassment, and reconcilable variations, and the principle of restraint. Now, because I'm limited in time, I'm only going to give one of those categories, and I'll only have time to scratch the surface even of that one category, which is the category of undesigned coincidences in the gospel. So this occurs when, basically when two works by different authors interlock in a way that would be very unlikely if one of them were copied from the other, or both were copied from a common source. For example, one book may mention in passing a detail that answers some question raised by the other. So the two records fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And it's best explained by giving examples. So here's an example taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 13. It says Jesus, as he's speaking about uh, Jesus' last Passover meal with the disciples, and it says Jesus laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel tied it around his waist. And he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Now, raises an interesting question in the mind of the reader. Why does Jesus wash the, their feet on this particular occasion? Now, we turn over to Luke's Gospel, a different Gospel, the parallel account of the Last Supper. And it says that a dispute also arose among the disciples as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Now, Luke, uh, only Luke mentions this dispute that explains why Jesus gave them the object lesson in servanthood. But John, although he reports the, ob the, the object lesson that was given rise to by this debate, he doesn't tell us about the dispute over who was the greatest. And so the two accounts fit together in such a casual way that points to the historicity of the account. Another example would be in Mark 14, verse 58, and this is when the um, when Jesus is at his trial before Caiaphas, and the false witnesses step forward, bearing false testimony against Jesus, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that's made with hands, and in three days we'll build another not made with hands. And then later when he's on the cross, it says that those who pass by derided him, whacking their heads and saying, aha, you would destroy the temple rebuild in three days. Now, nothing in the Synoptic Gospels provides a pretext for this accusation. Uh, it, the reader's just left, left hanging, uh, and this is a pretty serious allegation in the, first, in the context of first century Judea. This is not the sort of thing you want to make jokes about. Um, but so the, there's an, it's an unexplained allusion in Mark. The, we turn over to, Luke, uh, to, to John's Gospel in John chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. This is just after Jesus has, cl has cleansed the temple towards the beginning of his public ministry. And it says the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And so... Um, John gives us the original statement of Jesus, but not its use as an accusation and the misrepresentation of what Jesus had said. He never said anything about destroying a man-made temple and rebuilding it in three days, which is what we find in the accusation in Mark. The synoptics, Matthew and Mark, give us the accusation, but not the original statement of Jesus. So neither of those appears to be copied from the other. Another example concerning feeding the multitudes uh, in Mark chapter 6 it says that um, Jesus said to the disciples, come away by ourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going. So it gives you a picture of the hustle and bustle, of the people coming and going, it's very busy. So busy, in fact, they can't find leisure to eat their lunch. So it says they had no leisure even to eat. And so um, they go to, to a deserted area for peace and quiet. And then um, unfortunately the crowds follow Jesus and his disciples. And verse 39, it says that Jesus commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now in Israel, the grass is actually not uh, green is actually brown throughout the majority of the year, except a fairly narrow uh, window of time around the spring because of high levels of rainfall when the grass is actually green. Uh, and then when we turn over to John's account, uh, parallel with the feeding of the 5,000, we read in verse 4 in chapter 6, the Jewish Passover feast was near, uh, which makes sense of why it's so busy, because there's all these Jewish pilgrims coming in for the feast of Passover. And it also explains why the grass is green in a very casual and incidental and artless way, a way that points to historical reportage. Here's an example from Acts. So Paul's writing uh, 1 Corinthians from Ephesus around AD 53, or thereabouts. Uh, 
and uh, he's writing to Corinth, which is the capital of Achaia, what we now know as Greece. Ephesus is in Asia Minor. And he says in, ver in chapter 4, verse 17, that's why I sent you Timothy, my faithful and beloved child and Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. Now, we would infer from that clue that at the time of his writing from Ephesus to Corinth, Timothy's, Timothy's already been sent on his way from Ephesus to Corinth. When you turn over to chapter 16, though, in verse 10, it says, when Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. Now, notice the future tense, when Timothy comes, which implies that Paul expects this letter to arrive before Timothy gets there. So how can we make sense of those clues? First of all, Timothy's already been sent at the time of his writing, but nonetheless, he, Paul expects his letter to arrive before Timothy does. So we did therefore infer that Timothy must have taken some indirect route to Corinth. Um, and here's actually a map that shows where Ephesus is in Asia Minor and where uh, Corinth is in Achaia, what we now know as Greece. And the, um, the most natural way to send a letter would be by boat over the Aegean Sea from Ephesus to Corinth. And we'd infer that Timothy must have taken this indirect over land route going out through Troas and Macedonia on his way around to Corinth. Now, when we turn to Acts, we found that's exactly what happened. So in Acts 19, this is concerning when they were in Ephesus, it says, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, that's where Corinth is, by the way, and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And so he's, and having sent to Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. So he remains in Ephesus, and he sends Timothy up through Macedonia, exactly as you would expect, given those clues, these very casual incidental clues in First Corinthians. It doesn't even mention that Corinth is the destination of Timothy. So they fit together in a very artless way and it's interesting striking also that uh, tr timothy's traveling companion up through macedonia is erastus now who's erastus well we learn elsewhere that erastus is actually from corinth in romans 16 23 erastus the city treasurer of Greece, and we know independently the romans was written from corinth um second timothy 4 20 erastus remained at corinth um also here's a pavement slab that was discovered from the ancient ruins of corinth that mentions there was one erastus who laid down this pavement at his own expense um, and so that also actually is, is, is extra biblical archaeological support for a very minor New Testament character. So I think the, um, that those lines of argument and others uh, help to establish uh, with a quite high degree of confidence that we possess testimony from the apostolic eyewitnesses that Jesus rose physically from the dead and appeared to them alive. Because if the Gospels and Acts are indeed grounded in strongly reliable eyewitness testimony, then it stands to reason that the claims in the Gospels and Acts concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters actually reflect what the eyewitnesses purportedly uh, witnessed, what, what, they, what they claim. And so then we have to make sense of why they're making that claim. And, and I would then argue that the content of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceived. So when we inspect the resurrection appearances reported by the Gospels, we discover that they are public. They, Jesus appears to multiple people at once. Um, they are multi-sensory. They involve not just individual sightings from a distance or very briefly, but rather group sightings, group conversations with Jesus, physical contact with Jesus, long discourses with Jesus, eating royal fish with Jesus, having breakfast with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, according to Acts 1 and 6, across a 40-day time period, uh, and so forth. And so it, it's, uh, and it's like saying across time, not just a brief and confusing episode. And so that's the sort of testimony about which it's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about. Um, so um, so we've established then, I think, that uh, the content of the apostolic testimony makes it enormously improbable that they were deceived, honestly. And so then uh, we can investigate whether they, the apostles themselves were deceivers, whether they set out to deceive their audiences. And I would argue that the circumstances of the apostolic testimony makes it also enormously improbable that they were deceivers. Um, and so um, one argument for this of, of several that one could deduce is that the um, apostles are willing to suffer um, and endure persecutions and sufferings, and in some cases, martyrdom on account of their testimony. And that's surprising if they're just making stuff up, but not hugely surprising if they're actually sincere in holding this belief. So William Paley, again, one of my intellectual heroes, he says in his A View of the Evidence of Christianity, and I'm quoting, there was satisfactory evidence that many professing to be original witnesses of the Christian miracles passed their lives and labors, dangers and sufferings voluntarily under God in attestation of the accounts which they delivered and solely in consequence of their belief of those accounts, and that they also submitted from the same motives to new rules of conduct. Again, this observation is very surprising if they're just making stuff up, if they're lying, but not hugely surprising 
uh, much less surprising if they are sincere in holding this belief. And so the conclusion then that I want to draw is that the most probable explanation is that the content of the apostolic testimony is in fact true. And so I will finish with that and I will um, hand over to my opponent, Michael Gravado. Thanks for your attention. Thank you awesome. for that, Dr. McClatchy. Yeah, that was amazing. I mean, you got done right. You had a two-minute warning left. You know, <laughs> I was I was gonna give. I usually wait to one minute, but you had over two minutes left. Now that was good. Uh, a lot of people they they go over, but Mister Granado, how are you doing, man? No complaints. Doing so, good. You Thank know, you. I loved like you know. I love that you gave us a, a four minute video yeah. to look at. <laughs> Thank you, know, you, for that, man. you know, nobody ever does that. I mean, you're the only one in the years I've been doing this that you you sent a video saying, Hey, look, I, I'm absent. I can't do it. So here's a little video. I mean, that's that's professional, man. And I really appreciate it. Uh unfortunately we weren't able to play it live on the air because we couldn't get we couldn't get it to low right. And, oh, and then I'm I sorry, tried to yeah. share my screen. I tried to share my screen, and they couldn't hear it. Oh, but we did get to play it on the open mic, so we did. We did. Oh, get yeah, so okay. it was the first thing we played in the open mic, so everybody could see it right off the bat. But I do want to, uh, you know, just thank you for being here. And I know you're taking the negative position, and I will let you start whenever you have your first word. Do you have to share your screen too? No, so um, I'll, I'll go ahead and start real quick. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so I, I I had finals week. Uh, I'm a teacher. I teach uh, history and philosophy. Finals week was last week, and now I kind of feel like the student that shows up to the last day of class for presentations, and the A student volunteers to go first and is well prepared with the uh, PowerPoint and the well thought out speech, and then I have to follow that up. Um, I, I didn't prepare a PowerPoint uh, because the last time I was on one of these shows, they indirectly told me they didn't really like when people do PowerPoints. I love power as an educator. I love power. Anyway, yeah. Jonathan, that was uh, very well done. Very, very nice, slick PowerPoint. Okay. So I'll jump straight into it. Uh, so the question for the discussion is Christianity true. Um, you'll, you'll just have to stare at my ugly mug the whole time. Um, like any good philosopher, I'm going to start off by being overly pedantic. Um, it, is Christianity true? I, I think it depends on what you mean by Christianity, uh, and it also depends on what you mean by truth. Um, you getting some background music? Is that me? No. Okay, sorry. Ignore that. Uh, so it depends on what you mean by Christianity. It depends on what you mean by true, and I guess it depends on what you mean by is. I'm just joking. So depending upon what you mean by Christianity, I, I raise this point. Uh, it's not really, I don't have a horse in the race, but you know, Christianity, I don't need to tell any of you this, is, has been around for about 2,000 years. Uh, there's multiple versions of Christianity, fundamental disagreements, even over some basic Christian doctrines like the Trinity and the person of Christ. So it does depend on, you know, what operating definition of Christianity that we're going with. And I think that there are some versions of, I'm not like a staunch, I'm not going to give like a diehard no Christianity is not true on this, because I think there are some ways in which Christianity could be true. Um, one of the areas of philosophy I'm interested in is questions uh, about uh, questions about meaning in life. And if you accept Christianity kind of like on an existential basis, and you kind of have metaphorical interpretations of some of the stories in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, and you view Christianity as a source of meaning and value for your life, then yeah, I mean, I think Christianity could be true in that way. I don't really have any issue with that version of Christianity being true. However, kind of on the other end of the theological spectrum is the type of Christianity that holds to positions such as biblical inerrancy or forms of literalism. And I don't think that version of Christianity is true, right? But it also depends on what we mean by true. Now, typically speaking, when somebody asks if something is true, uh, they're either asking epistemologically, branch of philosophy called epistemology deals with the study of how we know what we know. Epistemolo epistemologically, how do we come to knowledge? How do we come to secure knowledge? How do we come to truth? Right. So if they ask, what is this true? Can we be confident that it's correct is the first meaning of truth. The second meaning of truth usually deals with some sort of ontology. Does something exist or exist? 
is this thing a part of reality? So two things I'm going to talk about tonight that I'm going to touch upon. Two different disciplines, uh, history and science. And I'm going to talk about kind of the epistemological criteria that both of these disciplines use, because I think they use slightly different criteria. And then I'm going to talk about the implications that this has for ontology, for what exists. So approaching Christianity from a historical perspective, and we ask, is his Christianity historically true? Uh, that's a little tricky because uh, any historian worth their salt will say that, of course, Jesus of Nazareth was a real person, Pontius Pilate was a real person, all of the disciples were real people, and the events that the disciples are describing in the New Testament happened, with the exception of the supernatural events. Right? But as Jonathan pointed out, um, there's the biblical evidence, there's extra biblical evidence, and no, nobody really argues about that, unless like you're a misinformed atheist that I see on YouTube debating whether or not Jesus was a real person. Uh, just drop it. That's just a, a horrible argument, right? Let's just get over it. But if we ask uh, with Dr. Leca McClatchy, sorry, Dr. McClatchy's argument that the resurrection was a historical event, we can ask from a historical perspective, was Jesus, quote unquote, actually raised from the dead? And I don't think that history can tell us that, is my argument. I think that we could talk about it as a matter of faith. And as Jonathan did, I think you can elaborate on it and kind of clarify it as a purpose of like systematic theology. But history as a discipline uh, can't get us to ontological claims about reality. And the reason for that is because such claims violate two basic aspects of historical methodology. And I can already hear people logging off with me talking about historical methodology. Bear with me. I'm going to throw some definitions at you. Um, the, the first thing that it violates is historical naturalism. So modern historical scholarship started in roughly the 17th century. Modern historical scholarship appeals to publicly accessible evidence to base explanatory claims on. Um, this includes human agency, human decisions, uh, nature, geography, uh, socioeconomic conditions. So when a historian looks at a time period and asks something along the lines of, you know, a good historical question would be, uh, why did the American Civil War happen when it did? Or what caused the American Civil War? Historians might talk about the uh, political history of the United States and talk about the um, debates that were happening in the First and Second Continental Congress over the basic structure of government and how representation would take place, specifically representation of slaves. Historians might talk about the economic differences between the North and South and talk about you know, the classic middle school history that the North was industrialized and the South was agriculture. Historians might talk about the origins and the evolution of the African slave trade. And all of those would be viable explanations for why the Civil War happened. But what you won't see with an American historian who's writing a book about the American Civil War and why it happened, you won't see appeals to supernatural causes or supernatural agency. And that's because supernatural causes and agency aren't publicly accessible and aren't able to be evaluated by other historians. So historians don't base their argument on it. I have a quote here from E.H. Carr, who wrote a book called What is History? E.H. Carr basically created the, uh, the, the class that every history major has to take on historical methodology. Carr says, an astronomer can believe in a God who created and ordered the universe, but astronomy is not compatible with belief in a God who intervenes at will to change the cause, course of the planet, to postpone an eclipse, or to alter the rules of the cosmic game. In the same way, a serious historian may believe in a God who has ordered and given meaning to the course of history as a whole, though they cannot invoke God as an explanation of particular historical events. And again, the reason for that is because that argument would be, uh, another historian would be unable to critique or to assess it, all right? So the other big 
methodological rule that this violates is that history cannot demonstrate ontology. No matter how much history you have, no matter how much eyewitness testimony you have, no matter how much archaeological evidence you have, you can't move from history to ontology. To show why this is the case, uh, I can give a very brief uh, reductio ad absurdum. It's a type of philosophical argument in which you use a particular sort of reasoning to show how it leads to uh, unacceptable conclusions. And so if I were to take the structure of the argument that apologists use as to why we should accept the resurrection of Jesus as a historical event, and I applied that same criteria to other historical instances, such as the miracles of Muhammad, or such as the miracles of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha, then you would also have to accept both of those as being legitimate. And in fact, if you continue on this process, the historical bar is so low that you would eventually have to accept basically the claims of any religion whose uh, leader or uh, disciples or followers witnessed a historical event that you'd have to accept all those claims ultimately as being true. And there'd be no way to demarcate between history and religion. You would just have to accept every religious claim as history. Now, there's a very simple way to refute everything I just said. I'm going to call this the Granado Challenge, although I probably shouldn't name it after myself because most people mispronounce my last name. David, you did a great job. You don't have to roll the R. You just, just plain American English, Granado is fine. So the Granado Challenge, if, if this is proven wrong, if, and listen, I've been wrong about most things in my life. So I'm not saying like you can never prove me. I'm open to it. I've been proved wrong about a lot of things. So if you can meet this challenge, I'll come back on the show and say that I was stupid and foolhardy and I spoke too soon. So the challenge is, if you can find another example outside of religious practitioners talking about religious history where this sort of methodology is employed by a historian. And I would like for it to be peer reviewed, of course, and appear in some sort of historical journal if that's peer reviewed. So can you give me an example of, let's say, a World War II historian that uses the same sort of methodology to talk about and to describe events that happened in World War II, an American historian talking about the Civil War. And if you can, I'll come back on and say I was wrong. I have to tell my wife that I was wrong every single day. So I'm used to it, right? Now, the second big thing I want to talk about is naturalism in the history of science. And again, I'm going to throw around some more jargon. So this is why a PowerPoint would have helped me here. So naturalism, methodological naturalism is an approach to scientific investigation. Uh, it started roughly in the 16th century with the Copernican revolution, the advent of modern science. Is an approach to scientific investigation that seeks to take phenomena on their own terms and to understand them as they actually are. This started with Copernicus who used mathematical models to argue for a heliocentric universe as a classic example. Uh, naturalism kind of comes to fruition with people like Galileo and Descartes, who, in addition to using mathematical models, appear to appeal to empirical criteria, observation, in order to make claims and justify claims about the natural world. But naturalism wasn't the only means that scientists used to describe events in the world. There are several examples throughout the history of science that I could point to that show that supernatural explanations were employed. They just eventually were shown, eventually replaced by natural explanations. The best example of this uh, would undoubtedly be Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton pub published his Principia. Of course, all you probably know Newton creating the uh, theory of gravity, um, kind of sparking and the, the, the history of astronomy culminates with Newton. He's able to do absolutely amazing things with it. But there is a problem with Newton's Principia in that Newton had a really hard time uh, addressing and describing the orbit of Mercury specifically. In fact, Newtonian mechanics were unable to 
adequately predict the orbit of Mercury. And it was such a problem for Newton that Newton said that occasionally what would have to happen is that the creator would have to intervene to, to set the planet back on course. Newton gave one of the first uh, God of the gaps arguments. But at the time, it wasn't a God of the gaps argument. It was a legitimate scientific explanation for why Mercury didn't just get gobbled up by the sun. Another example would be vitalism of the 17th and the 18th century, the idea that uh, biological processes couldn't be reduced to mechanical, naturalistic explanations, that there was something about life uh, that was inherently non-natural, i.e. the soul. This was eventually displaced by... One modern. minute, Michael. Awesome. Uh, modern, anyway, I can give a lot of examples. I'm going to skip those. Sorry. What I think this shows is that the history of science shows that the supernatural substructure that religions like Christianity rest upon have over the past 400 years been gradually replaced by naturalistic explanations of how the world works. That's not a knockdown, drag out argument to refute Christianity, but it does show that supernatural explanations no longer have a place in modern science. And if we're weighing them on a scale of whether it's a supernatural explanation or a natural explanation, it's probably the natural explanation. I'll end there. All right. Thank you, Michael. Um, Yes. We don't want you to come back on to tell us you're wrong. We just want you to come back on and tell us that you're convinced, okay? <laughs> but, hey, man, Mercury's a weird planet, too, all right? So let's yeah. just – yeah, yeah, Mercury's a weird guy. So, <laughs> But anyways, yes, gentlemen, that was the opening statements from both these distinguished gentlemen. I am just excited to see where this conversation is going to go. So um, when we start these type of formal things, we'll usually let the affirmative go first to begin to address things and then switch it up. You know, we let you guys kind of be free at this point, you know, but we usually started out with, Hey, let the affirmative ask the first question. And then you guys can, uh, you know, you guys are mature. We're all adults here. So we, we know that we could, we could like have a conversation and, and we'll moderate in between if things get too far afield and stuff like that, Correct. that we'll, does happen we'll. sometimes, especially among people like me, I'm a nerd. So sometimes I do go far afield on certain subjects. Uh, Tyler can, can attest to that, but uh, yeah. So Jonathan, yep. um, it, as far as, as far as Michael's opening statement, uh, I will let you decide where you want to start, brother. Have your freedom in Christ, brother. Sure. Oh, thank you. And supposing, th thank you, Michael, for your for your opening statement. Um, supposing hypothetically that you are wrong about your naturalism, how do you think you would go about discovering that? Yeah. Um, so my, uh, I think my naturalism is applicable in. There's kind of three different areas. Uh, philosophically, I'm a naturalist. Uh, historically, my background's in the history of science. Historically, history presupposes a form of naturalism. It's not the same as the philosophical naturalism. And then scientifically, I think science presupposes this a similar sort of naturalism. So it would have to be there's there's kind of different criteria for each. But historically, uh, like I said before, I, I think it would have to. If you could show me where a uh, modern 21st century historian appeals to supernatural claims or causes to to uh, explain their historical narrative outside of religious people arguing for religious history, I would I would be open to that. Yeah. Okay. So is it your position to clarify that there's no evidence for anything supernatural, or would you say there's evidence but you don't think it's sufficient to justify belief? No. So yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that, uh, I mean, I, I hate to do it. It depends on what you mean by evidence. Right? <laughs> I, I think there are, are people who claim to have witnessed supernatural things. Yeah. And I'm not willing to completely rule out the supernatural, like a priori by definition. I am open to the supernatural existing. I'll say that. Yeah. Right. So I, I guess what I'm asking you, so I, I'm a card carrying Bayesian <laughs> epistemologist. So would you say that there's no facts in the world which are made or rendered more probable on the supposition of theism than they would have been otherwise? Say that again for me, please. It, is it your position that there are no facts in the world which are rendered more probable on the supposition of theism than they would have been otherwise. 
I got to be completely honest with you. I failed college stats. So, um, <laughs> uh, so is there a proposition that would make theism more tenable? Is that what you're asking me? Or more probable than it was otherwise. More probable. Right? So, so, yeah. that, so basically, yeah. the, my concept of evidence is that which raises mm -hmm. the probability of a proposition being true, right? Yeah. So, for example, um, if you imagine uh, a court scene and the forensic expert witness comes forward and he presents the murder weapon that was used to perpetrate the crime and he shows that the accused fingerprints are on the handle of the murder weapon now that doesn't prove that the, the defendant is guilty but it is evidence for that conclusion by virtue of the fact that that evidence is rendered more probable mm -hmm. if we suppose that he is guilty than if he were uh, than if he were not guilty does that make sense it does yeah thank you for explaining that i'm a little dense at times um so yeah i think there could be uh, some examples. So, for example, you mentioned Paley. I think if um, Paleyan teleology were were shown to be uh, a viable explanation for biology, I think that would lend a lot more credence to theism. Mm -hmm. sure. um, if if something like, I mean, I think the best bet in the 21st century would be something like consciousness. If consciousness were were uh, shown to be irreducible to uh, processes in the brain, I think that would lend credence to not necessarily theism, but um, non-naturalism. Right? Yeah. It would be a concrete, uh, a concrete piece of evidence that not everything could be explained via naturalism. Okay, interesting. So, I mean, biology is my expertise, by the way. I have a, a PhD in biology and I, te I teach college biology. Um, so you, you said that you could, in principle, be persuaded by sufficient biological evidence of teleology along the lines of what William Paley uh, championed and more recently people like Michael Behe and Stephen C. Meyer and people yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so take, for example, um, the, the DNA replication machinery where we have uh, so I, I think there's there's merit to Behe's argument of irreducible complexity for many thousands of molecular systems that we discover in biology. So, for example, um, the DNA replication machinery is made up of multiple components that have to work together to achieve a higher level objective. So, you have, for instance, uh, the uh, initiation proteins that unwind the um, the DNA double helix, uh, you have the helicase that breaks the hydrogen bonds and DNA double helix to prepare for copying. You have the polymerase that actually performs the copying. You have the primase that synthesizes short RNA primers that the DNA polymerase can extend from. Uh, you have um, the uh, single strand of binding proteins that prevent the DNA strands from reannealing during copying. You have the tool isomerase that alleviates supercoiling upstream of the replication fork. You have, um, you have, um, the sl sliding clamp that clamps the polymerase onto the DNA strand to prevent it from falling off. You have the clamp loader that loads on the sliding clamp. You have a, a whole range of different proteins, um, and that's just scratching the surface. Um, the, the lagging strand has to be looked around and copied backwards, and you have to synthesize these short RNA, um, short segments of DNA from short pri RNA primers and stitch them together with ligase and remove the RNA primers, replace them with DNA. So there's a whole lot of processes that are necessary to achieve that higher level objective of replicating DNA. Now, if any of those components were missing, you wouldn't have DNA replication that worked half as efficiently as it used to, or a quarter as efficiently as it used to, but would be broken. And that seems to be a, a process that requires foresight to bring about. And it seems to me that only a conscious, intelligent being can visualize a complex end goal and then bring all everything together that's needed to actualize that end goal. And so that seems to me to be evidence that is rendered more probable on the supposition of design than it would be otherwise. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And I, I got to say, um, I like arguments like that uh, because they uh, play by the rules, so to speak, <laughs> right? So like when I ask for like, tangible evidence like this is what i'm asking for and I, I i do really appreciate that um however disclaimer i am not a biologist <laughs> so about 10 percent of that made sense to me um i will absolutely so uh, i read Behe's art is it Behe or Behe? i always get it is it Behe? Behe is the way Behe. i pronounce it yeah okay I'll, I'll take your i'll take your word on it Behe, if you're upset about it more than happy to have you on our youtube channel to talk about it um <laughs> I, I like, uh, so that was Darwin's Black Box. And then he published another book 
more recently. Uh, right? Yeah, he's, he has three books. So Darwin's Black Box in, the, in 1996, I think. And in 2007, yeah. there was the Edge of Evolution. And then more recently, okay. is Darwin Devolves. Yeah, so I, um, you know, be, not being an expert in the field, I love arguments like this. Um, but it's my understanding. So with Darwin's Black Box obviously caused a big splash. And then you have responses by people like uh, Kenneth Miller finding mm -hmm. Darwin's God. Um, it, it's my understanding that Behe's irreducible complexity, that most of the examples that he gave, I haven't kept up with his recent stuff, that most of the examples that he gave were able to be explained by biologists as being a result of natural processes. Sure. So I'm familiar with Ken Miller's objections. I, I don't find them convincing. And actually, some of his objections have been refuted by more recent scholarship. So, for instance, uh, he um, argued that the type 3 secretion system could be a stepping stone to put, to build a, a bacterial flagellum, which was a flagship uh, example that he championed in Darwin's Black Box. Um, it's now uh, turn, it's now come to light that actually the type 3 secretion system appears to be an evolutionary degradation product of the bacterial flagellum. And there's a number of lines of evidence for that. It makes evolutionary sense for one thing, because there's an evolutionary pressure to be able to swim before there's an evolutionary pressure to be able to inject poisons into multicellular organisms. Uh, also, the the, the bacteria that, that have um, type 3 secretion systems um, without the flagella, they have the genes for making flagella, even if no flagella are assembled. And uh, there, there's there's a whole range of arguments that I think establish quite um, well that the type secretion system came later than the bacterial flagellum. Um, so and, anyway, the, um, leaving aside, though, the problems that pertain to the co-option and acceptation models for explaining irreducible complex systems, which I, I've written on extensively, and as has Behe and other scholars like Scott Minnick and others, um, the examples that I like to champion um, would be examples like DNA replication, which I just articulated, or something like bacterial cell division, um, et cetera, or, um, be because these processes are fundamental for, um, for uh, differential survival, which of course natural selection presupposes. You can't, you, as a, pre, a precondition of natural selection is differential survival, of course. And so you can't invoke natural selection to explain the existence of self-replication without assuming the existence of the very thing you're trying to explain. So in the case of bacterial cell division, for example, in bacterial cell division, the bacterial cell actually elongates uh, in the case of a rod-shaped bacterial cell to double its original length and then it bifurcates in the middle and in order for that to happen the the cell wall of the bacterial cell actually has to get severed or broken um and it has and there so there's um there's um also lysins that facilitate that breaking and then the bacterial cell wall actually has to get resynthesized in a coordinated way um by uh, um there's a protein called back to prenyl that shuttles the black and precursors across the membrane and there are um, cross-linking proteins called uh, penicillin binding proteins, which we know are essential because if you knock them out by, if you um, target them with penicillin antibiotics, you disrupt the cross-linking process and that results in bacterial cell death. Um, and so how do you put together a mechanism for, re um, for breaking and rebuilding the cell wall of the bacterial cell um, while retaining viability all along the way? It seems to me that something that has foresight is required to put together systems like that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it... Uh, it does, and I, uh, I appreciate you sharing those examples. Um, yeah, I would. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy to. If you would, um, you said that you wrote some stuff on this. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll follow up with Behe. I, I thought Darwin's Black Box was very clearly written. Um, it's been my understanding, though, that this sort of thing is not really uh, uh, accepted by the current scientific consensus. Would you agree with that? Yeah, though, I would argue that the vast, vast, vast majority of working biologists don't know much about evolution. And of the minority of biologists who do know a lot about evolution, the vast, vast, vast majority of those don't know much about the scientific challenges to evolution. Um, and I, um, I I know this from many conversations with practicing biologists. The ver there's very, very few of them that actually are up up to speed on the ID arguments and challenges to evolution. So I would take the scientific consensus on this particular point with a grain of salt. I think it's fueled by ignorance rather than, I don't think it's an informed consensus. I think it's an uninformed consensus. Um, what was your perspective? I'm curious on the information arguments. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Stephen Meyer's work. I mean, he's a philosopher of 
science like yourself, uh, he argues that the information content of the cell is better is best explained by an intelligent cause because in every realm of experience, mm -hmm. when we're dealing with uh, information content, especially in digital form, we habitually associate that with conscious activity. What's what's your perspective on that argument? Um, so I am aware of who Stephen Meyer is, um, but I can't say that I'm familiar with his work. Um, okay. Most of what I do has to deal with the uh, history of physics. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Are, Philosophy well, of biology. Not I know of it, but it's not my forte. Yeah. Would, would you say, though, that the information content in the cell is rendered more probable on the supposition of design than it would have been otherwise? Um. <sighs> I mean, this is really bad for like a live debate and holding people's interest, but I don't know enough about that to, to say sure. one way or the other. Okay. I, I can't say with any confidence. It, it, yeah. Sure. That, that's fair. That's fair. Um, uh, do, sir, do, do you want to ask any questions? I've been kind of dominating a little bit here. No, no, no. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess my question would be, um, can you see kind of where I'm coming from in terms of uh, historical methodology? Um, these sorts of arguments, while I think what you said, obviously, well thought out, well put together, um, I, I see this more in, in line with like systematic theology, where you're kind of trying to put together like a coherent Christology or something along those lines. Uh, but that's not really something that like historians advocate for. Right. So kind of kind of gauge your response there. What would you what would you say to that? Sure. So I, I would challenge methodological naturalism. Uh, I, I think that it's misguided. Uh, I so the way that the argument is often articulated, the way that this is the way that Bart Ehrman, for example, would argue. And I think you probably would be sympathetic to this argument. Let me know if, if you are, which would be to say that a miracle by definition is the least probable explanation if it wasn't an incredibly improbable explanation it wouldn't be a miracle because a miracle by its very nature is the least probable explanation and so an historian can never infer a miracle as the best or most probable explanation uh, because that's the, an historian's job is to work out what's the most probable explanation and so any explanation no matter how counterintuitive no matter how implausible it seems to be is going to be more probable than a miraculous explanation and so should always be favored would that be something you would recognize yeah I mean, so I think historians are uh, inherently conservative when it comes to evidence. And when talking about and seeking to describe uh, causation and explanation and history, um, his history assumes naturalism in the sense that the types of explanations that are given are naturalistic, appealing to human agency, appealing to socioeconomic issues and causes, appealing to geography. Um, and like I said, I, I think, and we could talk about like kind of the definition of miracle, but I don't think historians, historians don't really like talk about that, right? The, the, the explanations that are given are given because they're open to critique and interpretation. So I, I agree with you that this is a very common historical methodology, is methodological naturalism. I'm just questioning whether it's a good historical methodology. So I, I disagree. Yeah. So it, I, I do think, I mean, certainly it's, it's, it's a good working methodology, but I think that there are cases where exceptions should be ad admitted. So in, in the case of um, Jesus, I think that if we can show that God plausibly has motivation for raising Jesus of Nazareth specifically from the dead, that renders the prior or intrinsic probability of God raising Jesus from the dead higher than it would have been otherwise. So I, I grant that the prior probability of God raising any old Michelini as random person from the dead, even on the supposition that God exists, is enormously improbable. Mm. But it doesn't necessarily follow that it's equivalently improbable in Jesus' case. And I would argue that there are independent lines of evidence that bear on Jesus' messianic and divine credentials, which then provide a reason to suspect that God may well see it fit to raise Jesus from the dead, and therefore it's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a potential explanation that should be on the table for discussion. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, my only concern with that would be that uh, it, it would create like a slippery slope. So if we, if, if I were to say like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. 
I can accept this in the case of Jesus. Um, then where's the bar there? Like, how do we distinguish history from religion and history from any the, the whole host of other eyewitness claims? Because if I accept that, then I also have to accept, accept Muslim apologists who are going to say the same thing about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, Buddhist apologists who are going to say the same thing about Siddhartha Gautama, the, you know, my Uncle Joe down the road who saw an alien last week. Like, it, it seems like you just, my Uncle Joe, I don't have an Uncle Joe, in, but anyway, it, it seems like you would just have to accept, like, all of those. Well, oh, there's viable eyewitness testimony, so therefore there must be a... Uh, uh, there must we have to accept some sort of the ontological aspect of these claims that part i'm not like super on board with so I, i'm not sure that that is the case I, I mean we have to of course investigate each of those miracle claims on a case-by-case -case basis mm -hmm. so obviously i'm not saying that we should just open the tanks and just let in any miracle claim i don't think any miracle claim should be allowed to stand but we have to look at the evidence so we have to look at particulars of the case um and so if you could adduce evidence for a particular miracle claim, which is comparable to the case for the resurrection, then I would by all means look at that. Um, of course, prior probability also has to play a role in this discussion. Are, are you on board with kind of a Bayesian approach to evidence, by the way, or? Um, I don't know enough about it to be on board with it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. but basically, though, what... Bay, a Bayesian concept of, of evidence would argue that, um, that, so evidence is measured in terms of a likelihood ratio. The probability of the evidence existing given the hypothesis is true on the numerator and on the denominator would be the probability of that same evidence existing given the hypothesis is false. And the amount of evidence that you need to justify a conclusion is true would um, inversely correlate with the prior probability. So the with, so if the, the prior probability is just the intrinsic probability, the, the probability that proposition just given the background information alone. Uh, and so if, if you have a lower prior probability, then you need more evidence to justify the conclusion. And so that's, I think, why um, oftentimes uh, scholars will adopt a methodological naturalism criterion, because a miracle is seen as being such an enormously low prior probability that any naturalistic contender is going to be rendered is going to be more probable, just because it accords better with with uniform human experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I for sure see where you're coming from, and that sounds like super reasonable. Um, with history, the part the part of the criteria for evidence is um, not so much the likelihood that it's the case, but its ability to be assessed and critiqued by others, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you have historical facts, things that happen in history, right? Napoleon, Crown Emperor of France, 1809. That's not really something historians debate. What historians will debate are narratives that are built around those facts. What did it mean that historian that Napoleon was crown emperor of France? What are the implications for the French Revolution? What are the implications for the French Republic after? All that good jazz. The, the narrative that's formed around those facts are predicated on the evidence that's used by the historian. And so my biggest concern from a strictly historical perspective, right, not even leaving out the question of the debate, is Christianity true? From a strictly historical perspective, for anybody that wants to appeal to uh, divine agency or uh, a supernatural event would be that there's, there's no way, if, if you're going to make that claim, there's, no, there's really no way for me as a historian to access that evidence. And history is built around public accessibility of evidence. Sure. So, I mean, I, I would disagree with that. I mean, there are scholars that do give a critical appraisal of the evidence for the resurrection. Gerd Ludemann, for example, would be one instance of that. Um, um, and there's plenty others. Bart Ehrman has, has written on this subject, uh, giving a critical appraisal of the case for the resurrection. Um, Paula Fredrickson, many other um, scholars who are not Christians. Uh, Dale Allison would be another example. He wrote a recent book on the resurrection. Um, so, I mean, th there are plenty of historians that write critical appraisals of the case for the resurrection. And so how would you square that with what you just said? Yeah, yeah. I mean, listen, um, I, I love the history of religion, and there's a whole host of uh, historical evidence for all sorts of different religious claims. And I'm not 
I'm not saying that the apostles, there's a difference between me saying like, yes, I recognize that uh, the apostle Paul claimed to have an experience with the risen Christ. But as a historian, it's I'm indifferent to the ontology of that claim. The ontology of that claim is not a matter of history. What is a matter of history, though, is Paul saying that he had that experience. And that's fine. Right? Sure. I, 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 would, I would agree that the um, th propositions like Jesus is, Jesus is God or that um, or, or, uh, or, or the, the Trinity is, is real or, or um, there's an afterlife. These, these are not questions of, of history. I would agree with that. But these are um, inferences that may be reasonably drawn from historical uh, truths such as the resurrection um, etc. So we can argue. So we can argue that on historical grounds that the resurrection is a historical event, and then tease out and elaborate the historical, uh, sorry, the, the metaphysical and theological implications of that uh, conclusion. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I, I, I can't go that far. <laughs> so, but but, but yeah. why? I mean, it's, it seems to me that you've created mm -hmm. a methodology that doesn't allow for you to find that you're wrong. No, no, no. So I, um, so I, I just don't think it's historical, right? Um, and and like I said, if, if you could find me a historian outside of a religious person writing about religious history, if you could show me uh, where uh, a World War II historian or a historian of the American Civil War uses a similar sort of criteria, then I would be comfortable saying, okay, well, maybe then there's something to this methodology that you've proposed. But me as a historian, well, I'm not really a historian, but as somebody who studied history, I'm not aware of any historian that does that. And that's what makes me uncomfortable with it. Okay, but uh, I, I, I don't necessarily think that there were miracles during World War II. And I, I don't think there's any prior reason to think that there were, that that God may have wanted to perform miracles in in some of these historical events that, that we're discussing. I think that when it comes to the life of Jesus, we already have independent reason to think that God plausibly has motivation for raising his son from the dead. So, for instance, um, we could look at the argument from messianic prophecy, which is to say that there are these ancient prophecies that concern um, the coming of Israel's Messiah. And... An example of a messianic prophecy would be so as i 53 verses 1 and 2 assert that the messiah was supposed to be rejected by his own people and yet as i 49 6 and as i 42 6 tell us that the messiah was supposed to be a light to the gentiles so god's salvation might reach to the ends of the earth so given that the messiah is going to be rejected by his own people the jews what then in light of that are the are the chances that this individual is nonetheless going to bring representatives of all nations to a recognition of the God of Israel. So again, that that um, observation that in fact Christ does bring representatives of all nations to a recognition of the God of Israel in spite of being rejected by his own people, the Jews, is rendered more likely if Christianity is true than it would be on its falsehood. And so that tends to confirm, not necessarily sufficient to establish on its own, but it tends to confirm Jesus' messianic and divine self-identity. Or um, the fact that Jesus is born in Bethlehem, which is something that you can historically corroborate, um, which would be in fulfillment of Micah 5, verse 2, um, etc. Et so that would be one line of evidence that would help to provide reason to think independently that God plausibly might have motivation for raising Jesus from the dead. Yeah, I mean, so I, I see where you're coming from. Um, and I, I hate to nitpick about it, but there, there would be further historical considerations that I would have to, to, to take in here um, when dealing with Messianic prophecy. Um, I don't know enough about those books that you referenced to be able to historically verify that uh, those events are in fact, and I don't know enough about the New Testament, to be frank, to verify that those events are in fact talking about Jesus. I think I could just point to the existence of contemporary Jews who would disagree with your interpretation of that to be sufficient evidence that there's other ways to read those texts. Uh, obviously, they don't accept that. Um, but yeah, I, th that would be an, another uh, uh, another violation. Uh, 
of historical method. Uh, historians, uh, I, I, I don't think, I don't think you can appeal to a god who manipulates history and still be doing history. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah. So, um, th this is what I what what I see um, happening in, in our conversation. So I'm I'm pointing out that methodological naturalism is fundamentally flawed in my judgment and you mm. are going back to um, consistently the fact that methodological naturalism is a common practice among historians and so yeah. in response to my point that this argument is fundamentally flawed your response is well we make this argument all the time and that doesn't help sure. me to see that the argument is not fundamentally flawed well um I guess I don't see, I don't see that it's flawed. Historians use historical natural. Now I would make a distinction between the type of methodological naturalism utilized in science and the type of naturalism utilized in history. Um, historians use naturalism for historical explanations um, because of the level of description that it's able to give us about the past. And my issue with, I mean, okay, so you're saying it's flawed. I can accept that maybe there are some issues with it. But the entire process of history itself is based on it, is what I'm saying. And so if you take that away, um, you're, you're taking away the efficacy of history at the historical method itself, is what I'm saying. And I'm not, as a somebody who teaches history, I'm not comfortable doing that. Okay. Do, do you think it's possible, though, that in some cases, the prior probability of God performing a miracle might be sufficiently high to at least consider the possibility, or at least consider as one contender on the table? Say that again. Do you think that there could be, in principle cases where the prior probability of God performing a miracle is sufficiently high to at least consider it to be a contending explanation that is on the table for consideration. Um, I don't, I, I could be willing to accept that. Could you give me an example maybe besides the resurrection? Sure. I mean, we, we can, um, well, I, I think, miracles in regards to jesus um and biblical miracles generally i i think that and so w when we have independent evidence that bears on um on the, the the existence of the god of israel so one piece of evidence for example that bears positively i think on the existence of the god of israel would be the survival of the nation of israel against all odds um given the, the the Assyrian invasion um, under Sennacherib, uh, the king of Assyria, uh, during the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, you've got the Babylonian exile, you've got uh, Haman's plot against the Jews, uh, you've got, uh, 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 under the Persian Empire, you've got the um, the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the Seleucid tyrant in the second century BC, where um, Antiochus Epiphanes was essentially the ancient equivalent of, of Adolf Hitler, uh, tried to stamp out uh, Jewish culture and religious practice. Um, you've got the siege and war um, against the Romans uh, uh, in AD 70, where the Romans besieged Jerusalem, culminating in the destruction of the temple and city in in AD 70, you've got um, the, the Nazi Holocaust. And through all of those trials, the nation of Israel has survived and retained their national identity. Now, not that, I'm not saying that that is sufficient evidence to conclude that the God of Israel exists, but certainly that evidence is rendered much more probable on that supposition that it would have been otherwise. And so it moves the needle in that direction. Um, so that's evidence that tends to bear favorably on the existence of the God of Israel. We've got the trilemma argument in the case of Jesus, Messi uh, Jesus messianic and divine identity, and that Jesus, there's very overwhelming evidence that Jesus thought of himself as God. He asserted himself to be God, and uh, it, either Jesus was God or he's not, or he wasn't. And if he wasn't, either he knew he wasn't or he didn't. And the fact yeah. that Jesus was willing to get himself crucified on that account is evidence that uh, tends to confirm that he's sincere. 
And there's a very small reference class of individuals that could be honestly mistaken about being the creator of the universe and the God of Israel incarnate. And Jesus doesn't seem to fit that reference class. And so that, again, moves the needle in the direction of Jesus divine identity. And so when you take all of these sorts of evidences cumulatively that I've been trying to adduce, that is relevant positively to the prior probability, the intrinsic probability, just given the background information of Jesus rising from the dead. And so I think that it's um, an ex the resurrection is an explanation that should be on the table for our consideration. Does that make sense? It does. So can I go back to this, uh, the survival of the nation of Israel? Yeah. The thing. So by nation of Israel, do you mean the Jewish people or like the actual nation yeah, itself? The, the, the Jewish people. Sorry, I should clarify that. The Jewish people. Right. So this is what um, what kind of uh, the, the, the red flags going up in my head about that. So let, let's stick with uh, World War II. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm more familiar with modern history. Sure. <laughs> um, the explanations for the Holocaust and for the Jewish people surviving the Holocaust, I'm not aware of any World War II historian that would say that that was the survive the survival of the Jewish people was a result of divine intervention or divine causation. So, I, I, so to, to clarify, um, I'm talking about the survival of the Jewish people and their retaining of their national identity through all of these ordeals taken together, the Babylon, the, the Assyrian siege, the Babylonian exile under Persia, right. under the um, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Seleucid tyrant um, after Alexander the Great. Um, you've got the, the siege of the, the Romans against Jerusalem uh, culminating in 70, and then you've got the, the Nazi Holocaust. And through all of those troubles, the nation, of it, the, the Jewish people have, have survived and retained their national identity. Now, that is not, in my view, sufficient evidence to conclude that the God of Israel exists. However, it is evidence that adds to a broader cumulative case. It moves the needle yeah. in that direction because that is highly expected if, if, if the God of Israel exists, but rather surprising on this falsehood. But I, I can explain to you and I can point to a, a whole host of history books that could tell you why the Jewish people were persecuted by the Nazis and how they survived that does not appeal to supernatural explanations. Like I, there's no need to appeal to any of that because we have a, a whole host of reasons, uh, political reasons about how Hitler and the Nazis took power and how Hitler blamed the Jews for what happened to Germany during World War I. We can talk about Jewish migration into Europe. We could talk about the social economic status of Jewish people in Germany. Like historically, there's there's no reason to appeal to any of that. To, to clarify, though, I, I'm not appealing to a miracle here. I'm appealing to providence. Providence is distinct from, from a miracle. Um, and I, I think that providence, special providence can contribute evidence to the case for the existence of the God of Israel and indeed the messianic and divine self-claims of Jesus. So, um, so I, I think that's just a misunderstanding of what I was saying, but I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to let Michael respond to that. And then I think we should go to uh, our five minute closing statements. You guys can take five through. It doesn't matter how long you take. <laughs> this has been going great. I've loved this conversation. Again, I'm humbled that both of you guys are here just talking about this. And this type of conversation here is the type of conversations we aspire to, to just be able to talk stuff out. And then afterwards, uh, we do have some questions from the audience and some question. Well, at least one question from the host. <laughs> so I take priority there. So <laughs> it's, it's the show, you know, it's our show. So, yeah. But uh, anyways, again, thank you guys for being here. Uh, Mike, go ahead and uh, um, respond to that. And then I'll jump back in and let uh, Jonathan make his final uh, um, statement. Yeah. yeah I mean, um, I, I see where you're coming from. I just, in, in historical reasoning, uh, I think what might be causing the issues here is historians don't really deal with probability in that way. And with the example of Jewish people in 20th century Germany, um, there's just no need to expeal, uh, appeal to divine providence because we can fully explain what happened by appealing to politics, by appealing to economics, by appealing to anti the history of anti-Semitism in Europe. 
and all that other good stuff. Like Providence doesn't even factor into the equation. So that, that that's just what I was going to say. All right. Uh, so, Jonathan, if you could just uh, give us a, a closing statement or closing remarks, whatever you'd like to do there, um, I would appreciate it. I'll let you start whenever you want. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for participating in this discussion. It's been a joy and I've enjoyed our dialogue. Um, so just to recap on my basic arguments for Christianity. So I said I have six basic arguments for Christianity. Uh, one would be, of course, the resurrection of Jesus, which I articulated in my opening statement. And we saw that uh, we have incredible testimony in the Gospels and Acts um, uh, that can be um, linked to substantially trustworthy eyewitness testimony. And that being the case, then we have to take seriously that the Gospels and Acts actually reflect the testimony of the apostles concerning the resurrection of Jesus and the nature and variety of the pertaining experiences. And when we look at the uh, the claims in the Gospels, they're the sort that's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about. They are multi-sensory in character. They involve it, not just individual sightings at a distance, but group sightings, group conversations, physical contact with Jesus, et cetera, extending across a long period of time. And then when you look at the, con the, the circumstances of uh, the early apostolic um, church, we discovered that the apostles were willing to voluntarily endure sufferings and labors and dangers and hardships and persecutions and toils and so on, um, in some cases martyrdom, on account of their testimony that Christ was raised from the dead and that Christianity is true and that Jesus really is the Christ. And that is surprising if they're making stuff up deliberately and trying to deceive people, but it's, it's much less surprising if they are in fact sincere. Um, so that's the argument for the resurrection, that the most probable explanation is that Jesus, in fact, did rise from the dead. Then you've also got the trilemma argument, which says that Jesus um, um, claimed to be God. There's very compelling evidence for that we could talk about, which, uh, and if that's the case, then either he was God or he wasn't. If he wasn't, he either knew about it or he didn't. And the, um, uh, and, uh, the fact that he's willing to get himself crucified on account of that claim is compelling evidence of his, of his sincerity. And there's a very small reference class of individuals that could be honestly wrong about being the creator of the universe and the God of Israel incarnate. And Jesus doesn't seem to fit that reference class. You see his very humble demeanor, for example, washing the disciples' feet, et cetera. And, and uh, he seems to be level-headed and very intelligent. And so um, and, and that, again, may not be sufficient to establish Jesus' divine identity. I'm not committed to showing that, but it does move the needle in that direction. The argument for messianic prophecy, which I began to articulate, and I give a few examples of that. Another example um, is that Jesus' death happens to coincide with the Jewish feast of Passover, given the theological import of that. That's again, a striking coincidence and because the Passover lamb was the lamb that the Hebrews had to slaughter and spear the blood as, as blood on their doorposts. Um, and the angel of death, when he went through Egypt during the last of the 10 plagues um, to smite down the firstborns of the households, when he, he saw the blood, the angel of death would pass over those homes, leaving the firstborn unscathed. And so Jesus becomes that Passover lamb that we smear his blood to our, the doorposts of our hearts and the wrath of God passes over us. And so it's quite fitting then that Jesus' death coincides with the Feast of Passover. So that would be another example that adds to that cumulative case from Messianic prophecy or Old Testament fulfillment that moves the needle in the direction of Jesus' Messianic and divine identity. You've also got the conversion of Paul, which I think is uh, compelling evidence as well. And um, that um, Paul seems to have been sincere, given how much he was persecuted and suffered and, and was even martyred, ultimately. Uh, we have evidence from, for that from his own testimony and his own letters. We have Clement of Rome, who is a companion of Paul, who wrote at the end of the first century. You have Luke, who testifies to it as well. And this sort of um, encounter that Paul had on the Damascus Road was a veridical one that is difficult to be honestly mistaken about. Um, you've also got the argument from contemporary miracles as well, which we haven't talked about. Um, I refer people to Craig Keener's two volume set on that or um, to Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Miracles. And then I also alluded to the survival of the nation of Israel against all odds. Um, and so it seems that my my opponent this evening, um, Michael Granado, is um, he, he wants to defend methodological naturalism, uh, which is fine. But when I point out some of the fundamental problems with methodological naturalism, his response typically is, well, um, historians engage in methodological naturalism all the time. This is standard historical practice, but it doesn't help when I point out that there's, an, a, there's a serious problem with your argument to then say, well, we make this argument all the time. That, that really doesn't help me uh, particularly much. Um, and in fact, um, one, one other point I'll make very briefly in closing about um, miracles is that it's often pointed out that miracles 
deviate from the normal course of nature. And so that's why they have such a low intrinsic probability. And so any other cause should be preferred. But um, if, if God has wrought, has wrought miracles in history as authenticating signs to authenticate a messenger or prophet, then it, it by, de by definition, m miracles have to rec recognizably deviate from the normal course of nature. And so the fact that they do, in fact, deviate from the normal course of nature can't be taken as a serious blow against the hypothesis that God has used miracles as authenticating signs in history. But um, I'll close with that and pass over to Michael Granado for his closing statement. All right, Michael, go for it, brother. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again, Jonathan. So yeah, my position can basically be summed up. Um, I focused on two aspects here. Is Christianity true? Again, depends on what you mean by Christianity. Uh, it depends, depends on what sort of truth claims that we're using to evaluate, what sort of claims that we're making. Um, I issued the Granado Challenge, naming after myself to be super humble. Uh, is there another example outside of religious people talking about religious history uh, where this sort of reasoning is used, where appeals to supernatural causations or appeals to supernatural agency are utilized? To go back to the World War II example, we can explain everything that happened to the Jewish people uh, simply by appealing to politics, economics, history, uh, the history of the Jewish people, history of migration. Um, and so there's no real historical need to appeal to providence and appeals to providence are ahistorical in that they're not open to uh, susceptible to critique and evaluation by other historians. Uh, and that's why we prefer naturalistic explanations. And my final point uh, was that the history of naturalism and the history of science, uh, scientific naturalism, the applying of mathematical models to explain natural events and the use of empirical data and observation to confirm those models uh, has proven over the course of the 400 years to be the better explanation. When supernatural explanations have been given in science, they are almost always replaced by natural explanations. I will say thank you to Jonathan for giving some contemporary examples of that. I'd be more than happy to look into it. Um, and yeah, I'll close with that. Awesome. Thank you, guys. I look, this is when, when you don't have moderators stepping in and directing, that means you guys are handling the job perfectly. And this conversation has been amazing. Uh, and again, I, I just I, I thank you guys, and I'm humbled that you guys are here. Um, so I'm just gonna uh start getting into questions here. Um, the first one's by me. Because, Michael, <laughs> you know, I did have three. They just disappeared. I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, maybe Tyler can find them for me. But, uh, you know, one of my big areas, as I'm a master student as well, and uh, one of my areas is really in the history. I'm probably going to write my thesis on some historical stuff. Okay. So um, what I have here is just – a confusion with your historical methodology here. And um, let me just read to you some of these things I've got. Okay. Now, I don't know if you know who James Rochefort is. He's a historian and he says that uh, he, he quotes uh, from um, method and criteria, right? So he says that some have counted up to 25 different criteria to establish historicity. Okay. Um, so when it comes to the historical res, uh, uh, the historical, uh, evidence for the resurrection as, uh, Jonathan has produced, uh, it does meet, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go down the 20, the 25. I'm sure you know some of what they are. Okay. So we get dissimilarity, right? We've get multiple attestation, right? And we get embarrassment, even though embarrassment sometimes is on the fringes of, of whether that should be a criteria or not. But the gospels meet all those. As a matter of fact, I would say they meet the large amount of the 25 that are mentioned to establish historicity. So why – I don't know. You keep – to me, appealing to a consensus of mm. – you, you know, and stuff like that. But there's also 
a wide consensus that accept a, a lot of the minimal facts that 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 if you put together cumulatively and meet the criterion of historicity, it leaves you with really only one probable explanation. And when you were talking about Bayesian and stuff like that, that that doesn't really fly when it comes to probability. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you, you know, it does. I've seen it. You know, you, you know, a lot of historians, they take from multiple areas. So my question is, how do you – and I know I'm, I'm comment more than I, I question. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, so where do – okay, so what do you draw your conclusion from versus the things that I just said where it does meet the criteria of history? Listen, I think the uh, – if we're talking about the gospel specifically, I mean I, I'm not – Maybe part of the confusion here. I'm not debating whether or not the Gospels are a, a historical source. They are, for sure, mm -hmm. right? But uh, history doesn't deal in ontology, right? And Correct. I think if you're going to argue that it does, that's where you kind of get into that slippery slope that I was talking about. Yeah. So, you, so yeah. yeah. So back to that. Just back to that, though. I'm just what I'm, you know, you have these minimal facts, these, all these things coming together in a cumulative case, right? Mm -hmm. We can, we can determine just like we do with anything else in ancient history. And I know you're, you're more modern history. Uh, my, my field is first century history. So uh, where I think that's okay. So I'll use an example. You want to use war two. I'll use Roman formations, right. For battle, right. There's, there's a way we can determine the box formation or the three line formation that they used that was, you know, gathered uh, originally from the phalanx, but then modified to almost one of the biggest destructive killing machines that history has ever seen. The Roman Empire with their long shields, their small gladiuses, their, their, their uh, uh, spears in the back with javelins in the third row, but they're resting those javelins, right? So that guy can actually run up and, and be the shield wall, you know? And that's how they rotated. They rotated people, which is phenomenal feat of, of uh, military history, considering you're actually fighting real people on the other side, right? So, but, but we do the same thing with all other history. You know, we use these, these areas and we put them together and we make a conclusion. So why wouldn't the resurrection be a probable conclusion that that's kind of really my sure. question but i gotta go, i gotta move on so <laughs> yeah 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 um well let's go back to your roman formation example right um so why would i accept let, let's say that we didn't that we only had eyewitness testimony of roman formations and that we didn't have any uh archaeological evidence that the romans actually did anything like that right so why would I accept in that situation that the Romans actually did use what is the formation called? I was talking about the box formation. Box and formation. The three. <laughs> I can't remember. I know the I know the box formation is the one where they have they break into a box formation with the general shouting out orders, and they can basically move all over the field in that box formation mm -hmm. in unison, which is a, a feat of of ex incredible discipline. Right. So let's say that we only had uh, Germanic sources about the Romans using a box formation. We had we didn't actually have any Roman sources for them using a box formation. And you ask me, is is this something that is historically verifiable? Uh, in that case, I would say yes. Right. Uh, why would that be historical, historically verifiable and not the resurrection? Um, because that is theoretically I can draw upon other, and this is really a stress for me because I don't deal with ancient history. So this probably doesn't make any sense. A modern historical example would be better, but I can draw upon other uh, uh, publicly accessible data. So for example, I can go into a field and put a bunch of men together with shields and have them battle Germanic warriors to see how well they would do and say, oh, okay. So it looks like this would be feasible, right? I, I can't do that with the resurrection, right? So that, that's where the that's where the rub would be. And again, a modern example would be I could better deal with that. But yeah, even if it meets all the other historical criteria and all that stuff, 
because that, that, that wouldn't be yeah. a question of ontology, right? Okay. Because we know Roman right. soldiers exist Fair and enough. we know that they can move in formations. That's not an ontological question about whether or not okay. Romans existed, period. All right. Um, okay, so the next one is for Jonathan McClatchy. Um uh, it's talking about undesigned coins. It is there's another phrase for it, but it means at least two sources complementing each other, but without authoring intending to. Uh, I, I think I think what was asked. I don't know if that was exactly the right one, uh, but just clear what you mean by uh, undesigned coincidences that you see. Sure, I, that that was more of a statement rather than a question. But an undesigned coincidence is basically where you have two um, or more accounts concerning an event uh, that overlap such that one account uh, explains in passing uh, a natural question that's raised by the other. And so the two accounts fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. That's kind of the classic form of an undesigned coincidence. There are other forms of undesignedness, but uh, that that would be a, a quick and easy definition of, of an undesigned coincidence. Awesome. Well, I'm going to stick with you, uh, Jonathan, and let you answer this one. This one says, NDE abo, <laughs> abiogenesis, I can't even say the word, <laughs> return of the God hypothesis. Is there any way to experience the world in a non-naturalistic way, considering the supernatural is at least possible? I think that's for Michael, is it not? No, that's for you. Is that for me? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's for both of you. You both can well, answer. Well, obviously, it's I'm going to say yes. Uh, I think this is more of a question that's directed at Michael, if I'm reading it correctly. Okay. So, Michael, go ahead. Uh, we'll let you answer it as well. Um, NDE, I buy Genesis, return to the God hypothesis. Is there any way to experience the world in a non-naturalistic way, considering the supernatural is at least possible? Yeah, um, I, I would need to know what is it abiogenesis is uh what that means the origin of life okay uh, what the return of the god i'm not sure what they're That's referring to Stephen myers recent big okay yeah I'm, i haven't read it but uh, is there a way to experience the world in a non-naturalistic way i would say that most of your data is the way to experience the world in a non-naturalistic way considering the supernatural is at least possible uh I'm, I'm having a really hard time following that. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't, I'm not super familiar with Stephen Meyer, so I'm not. No, that's fine. Know. All right. We'll move on to the next one. It, it's no big deal. Um, we don't know everything. Sometimes we can't understand <laughs> some things. I'm sorry. I'm I really can tell sorry. you students yeah. like us, it, it, we have bad spelling sometimes when we turn in papers, right? <laughs> Anyways, a uh, question for Dr. McLashley. Some defend a flat earthers uh, or a flat earthers and no one actively lied to them nor do they think they are lying. Uh, they mean it, so does removing deceit really mean something is true? No, absolutely not. And I didn't imply otherwise in my remarks. Uh, obviously, someone can be honestly mistaken. I, I just don't think that that pertains to the Gospels because I think that the content of the apostolic claim is, uh, very, diff is, is very difficult to be honestly mistaken about because of the multi-sensory character of the resurrection claims. They involve multiple sensory modes uh, over a period of 40 days. They involve uh, individual sightings and group sightings, um, uh, different circumstances with appointment, without prior appointment, they involve physical contact, long discourses, group conversations, and so on, even breakfast with Jesus. It's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about that. And uh, another evidence that suggests that they're not honestly mistaken is, um, in addition to that, is that um, all so for, and Paul uh, in First Corinthians 15 mentions that uh, Christ is the first fruits from among the dead. And what he means by that is that Christ is the fulfillment of the first fruits feast, uh, because um, the first fruits feast is written about in Leviticus 23, where um, on the on the um, day of first fruits, the Jews were to celebrate the first fruits of the harvest, which is a guarantor, if you will, that the rest of the harvest is to come. And so Christ is the fulfillment of the first fruits feast because he is the first to be raised to glory and immortality ahead of the general resurrection at the end of the world. So he's the guarantor, if you will, of the general resurrection at the end of time. And uh, it's very striking then that in all four gospels, uh, Christ's Resurrection Day is actually on the day of first fruits. It's on the first Leviticus 23 says that the feast of first fruits is to be celebrated the day following the first Sabbath following Passover, which would make it the Sunday. And so it's, it's striking then that Christ 
Christ's resurrection happens to correspond with that. And there, there was a disagreement, of course, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees over whether the Sabbath in view in Leviticus 23 actually was the weekly Sabbath or whether it was the special Sabbath of the Passover itself. Um, the Sadducees, though, who had control of the temple in the first century, uh, the, the, who were controlling the temple cult, they... Um, their, their view was the one prevailed, which was that it was the, the the weekly Sabbath. So that would make the Feast of First Fruits the Sunday. So it's striking then the, the early church from very early on actually changed their sacred day from the Sabbath day or the Saturday to the Sunday, the Lord's day, um, the first day of the week, because that's the day on which Christ rose from the dead. And so that coincidence that Jesus' resurrection happens to coincide with the Feast of First Fruits is um, it, it points uh, to design either in the part of God or in the part of the human authors. And so it points away from the honest mistaken hypothesis. And then we have to adjudicate, okay, are they lying or did Jesus in fact rise from the dead? And it seems very improbable to me from a whole range of different reasons that they're lying. And so then that points to the resurrection as being the best explanation. Right on there. Um, question from Michael. Is there anything that could happen to you personally in which you would switch to Christianity? Not just finding it reasonable, but you becoming a fierce advocate. Yeah. Um, so I used to be a Christian. So what led me to that were um, uh, a whole host of life events. Um, but is there something that could happen to me now? Um, that would lead me to be a Christian specifically. Um, I mean, my mind could be changed about a lot of this stuff, and I've kind of already, I don't want to beat a dead horse, uh, I've already hinted at some possibilities there, uh, showing me how and when contemporary historians use this sort of reasoning to talk about things outside of religious history, showing me an aspect of the natural world that can't be reduced to a natural process. Jonathan gave me an example. I'm going to go look that up after this is. Um, I think most people base their religious beliefs on personal experience. Um, that was going to be what I said, but I've, I've had a lot of personal experience, especially as somebody that deals with and struggles with mental illness. So I, I can't really fall back on personal experience as a, as a basis for an epistemological belief. Um, as not to sound like too full of myself, but I would, I would like to see some solid arguments that uh, don't rely on personal experience, don't rely on special pleading, uh, and that uh, appeal to, to uh, common evidence that I'm able to assess and evaluate. I'd like to think I'm open-minded enough to be able to engage with that. Yeah. Mike, Michael, real quick, if, right. if you, if you're able, I would be, if you are able to say so very briefly, I'm just curious, what was the main reason that led to your deconversion? If you don't mind saying. Oh, uh, how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe not. Uh, a, a, a whole host of things. Uh, oh, okay. Jonathan, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to, to have the conversation privately. If sure. You mind. Yeah. Sure. Of course. Awesome. Yeah. Y'all keep in touch, man. That's what it's all about, you know, and then talking even further and getting to know each other. It's awesome. Um, question for Michael. This is the last one. Uh, if Christianity is true, that means Satan is in the world deceiving and blinding it. Could a world of deception and confusion be an evidence for the case of God? I guess this is a hypothetical. Jonathan, I'd like your opinion as well. So, Okay, sir, can you put the question back on the screen? Uh, yes, stand by. There we go. Uh, you want to go first, Jonathan? Uh, you can go first if you want. Okay. <laughs> it's a hypothetical. Have fun right, with uh, it. <laughs> this uh, is a fun question. <laughs> if, if Christianity is true, that means Satan is in the world deceiving and blinding it. Could a world of deception and confusion be evidence for a case of God? Could deception be evidence for a case of God? I'm... I'm not a believer, but I don't think that would be a good case for God. Right. Jonathan, I, I feel free to correct that. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'd agree with that. I, I didn't find that argument to be at all compelling. Right on. Again, guys, here we go. Sorry. That's the end of question and answers. You guys have done great. Again, I am humble. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here. Thank you, Michael. You guys have made this show even better. And yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you both of you. Yeah. Not a problem. Well, guys, that's the end of 
the launch event. Uh, this has been the finale. Uh, again, we thank all of our guests, all of our participants throughout the day. We had so much content thrown at you guys today. Go back, check it out, rewatch it again, do whatever you got to do. It's good content. This debate has been phenomenal. I've loved it. Again, I thank everybody for being here. Thank everybody for uh, coming on again today, making this event happen. God bless you all. At the end of the day, you decide, and we exist to 